Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thanks for tuning in for this September 2021 Radical Exchange live stream. Today's topic is exploring social technologies and their role in fostering democracy. My name is Jennifer Marone and I'm CEO of Radical Exchange Foundation. And I have the pleasure of joining me today, Kalia Young and Heidi Saul, who are experts in group processes and who are co-facilitating the next annual Radical Exchange Conference with us. And we also have Tom Attlee here, who has 32 years of experience in co-intelligence and public intellectual research and writing about it. So I'm very excited that we can get together to talk about social technologies, what they are, the role in fostering democracy. We are at the moment in a real crisis of democracy on a big D scale. And we have a lot of critical consequences kind of coming our way, insurmountable challenges from climate change, global economic disparity, the pandemic, on and on and on. And we really need to figure out how we can work together, understand each other, build trust among each other, and arrive at decisions together um, to be able to survive these bees and smaller and greater challenges that we face. So while we have a lot of pockets of innovators that are working on civic tech, we in this community, I think I'll note that technology alone as a like application thing is not going to solve everything. And we need to work together on talking and there are processes and methods that have been built to do this over time. And that's what we call social technologies, I would say. So to kick off this, Oh, one last thing. Um, the reason why we're heading into this kind of discussion is because we're, for the next annual Radical Exchange Conference, we're going to do something different. We're not dictating what the program is. We want people to come together and propose sessions as to what they think needs to be talked about, what they think needs to be worked on. And so we are using open space technology for this. So we're going to have three events over December. One will be in Taipei, Taiwan on December 4th. The second will be online on G GMT time, so Europe time, Africa time. Um, that's December 10th. And the third will be December 17th in Denver, Colorado, also in person, pandemic permitting. So to get this conversation started, I want to start with a very seemingly basic question or seemingly basic answer. I think we all have ideas in our head, but Tom, I'd like to ask you, what is democracy? Well, technically democracy is governance by the people, uh, ordinary people. And part of the co-intelligence view of democracy is that everybody is, all, we're all co-creating our lives together in communities and countries and whatever. And this is a way, um, democracy would ideally be a way to do that more consciously. So we're aware, we're co-creating, we co-create it together, realize we have shared lives, not just individual lives. And we work together solving our problems and pursuing our visions uh, and learning together as we go. That's the ideal democracy. Democracy is a million different forms, all having to do with the extent to which we the people are actually running things. Thanks. I don't know. Um, Kalia, we can talk about social technology. You're an expert in technical technology, digital identity, and you've been um, on RxC several times. You've been on this live stream several times to talk about this work in this technical way. But can you then tell us what social technologies are to you? Maybe she's first. Here. Yes, I can. Um, so one of the things I learned early on working on digital identity protocols in the technical world was that it is in fact these protocols, these um, ways to encode information and share it and have meaning made at the other end that, that are a key um, way to understand digital and technical technologies. And 
they also are a way to think about social technologies. What is the recipe for how we conduct ourselves together in time and space to help make decisions um, and to take action in groups? So social technologies support human beings coming together. Uh, I think in some ways, the ultimate social technology that we've had for hundreds of thousands of years is sitting around a dinner table or a campfire and having a conversation with one another. But that form doesn't necessarily scale up to the size of 100 or 200 or 1,000 people or the scale that we're trying to operate on in, in large democratic societies of millions of people. So we need to innovate other processes and protocols for how we connect and discuss. And that's, that's what I see social technology sort of being a, um, an important tool. And we need to, just like we've spent the last, you know, <laughs> we've been innovating sort of the technical technologies that run our world for hundreds of years. We've had democratic technologies like voting for representatives is a 300 year old technology. And in some ways it's, it's worked incredibly well. And in other ways it's breaking down. And I think we need to research and invest in new innovative ways to support large scale sense making. Um, just as we've spent millions of dollars of government money investing in technical technologies. And I think it's under you know, without these innovations, I don't know how we get through, like you said, the crises that we're facing. So social technologies range everything from, you know, how to conduct meetings at a small scale to how to tap into the wisdom of the whole at the size of millions of people. Thank you. Okay, now to get the third piece of it, we have democracy. <laughs> trying to do the social technology. And then Heidi, you're a facilitator of open space technology, which is a social technology, but so both inside and outside organizations and open settings like the conference that we're gonna be having. Can you share with us an example of open space um, that's been taken up by an organization as part of the cultural learning experience so we can kind of get an understanding of how to use it? Yeah, um, I'm smiling because it's such an unusual um, organization. It's a nonprofit that I work with locally here in Santa Fe, and it's called Assistance Dogs of the West. And their guiding principle is take care of the dogs and the dogs will take care of you. And you might think how in the world could using open space technology influence an organization like this, whose main purpose is training canines for one-on-one -on -one help and interestingly, one-to-many help. So they train dogs that can sit in, a, that are allowed to sit in a courtroom with a child that's having to testify about something awful that's happened to them. They train dogs that go with FBI agents to big crisis places. So I've met dogs that were in um, at the Pulse uh, shooting in Florida and that was that were at the uh, Las Vegas mass shooting. Um, and they also um, work with dogs that work with veterans. So their service, to the world, to our country, and they do place dogs internationally is large and it's service oriented. Um, I know the executive director and she'd heard me talking about open space for a long time. And she and the founder came to me and said, we really think we need an open space. And somehow they understood how it worked. And we started in 2016, I think it was, with an open space where they invited um, all of their staff, they invited their donors, they invited clients, people who had uh, gotten dogs from them, like courthouses in other parts of New Mexico to participate in this. And their theme was, what's your passion? What's our future? 
And of course, um, when I was telling Tom about this yesterday, he said, and were there dogs there? And I said, absolutely, there were dogs because um, you take care of the dogs, they'll take, they'll take care of you. So um, we did this one day open space and many, many things came up because there was full permission for everybody to raise anything that they wanted to. So internal issues got raised and resolved concerns of the donors and clients. And so they were left with a huge amount of information from which to move forward. And they took that seriously. We, um, we worked together to take that information and move it into strategic planning. Uh, where we did another open space based on what had been identified. And that group of people, which were board members and other people interested in ADW in a bigger way, um, came together. And their theme for their conversation was um, our legacy, your legacy, what part do you play? Because they were looking for where people wanted to step up and participate. Um, after those two occurred, we did a lot of internal work and all in the employees were invited to give input. And from that point forward, the languaging within this fairly small, they have 12, 12 full-time staff entity has been, we don't run without all of your input. Um, I facilitated meetings, we referenced open space, um, and they genuinely took on board the idea that everybody's voice makes a difference. Most recently, we got together in July for the first time since the pandemic. They hadn't been together. And the executive director said, you know, we should do an open space because so much has been happening. Um, we got to be together. We were all vaccinated. We didn't have to wear masks. It was quite thrilling. Um, and uh, the theme this time was, um, how are we growing? Where are we going? There were a couple of brand new employees. They quickly got that the culture was that they didn't have to talk behind the scenes, that they could actually put a session on the wall and talk about the thing that they were uh, concerned about. And um, what I've observed is that the founder and the executive director and their top people who were involved in that first open space they really took it to heart and they operate that way. And it serves their operation in that things aren't happening underground anymore or off to the side because what people have experienced is that it will be heard and discussed and decided upon and that their voice counts. So that's my little small D, uh, someone taking a social technology and making it part of the way that they operate. Wow, that sounds great. That's I I'm thinking about because I've never participated in an open space conference, on conference, or even uh, Tom, you you've told me in one of our talks before we, there's a podcast from some months ago that I had the pleasure of talking to you on. And you brought up this experience from uh it was in canada oh okay mclean's canada but i we don't have to jump to that right now but i'd love to get mm -hmm. to that as because it's just sure. for people like myself i've been now or our team at radical exchange has been talking with heidi and kalia we're going to participate in the iiw conference unconference coming up soon um and it's it feels very, very different. I think I'm a shy person and I hold back. So it's like, I think, I wonder how will I be, will I really put up a session? Um, will I just wait till I see somebody else put up something similar and I'll go there. So I wonder at what, what kind of scales this, this starts to work on and how it can work on larger scales, how, what happens at the start where of say like an open space and conference or um, Tom, your experiences and getting people to open up that are maybe like hold back a little bit. And what's this comfort zoning 
process. There are many different, there are many different uh, social technologies and open space is one of them. And one of the things that both the people who work with social technologies and the people that work with digital and communications technologies uh, aren't doing as much as should be done is weaving different processes together because they have complementary functions. Uh, and so you being, being uh, um, bashful, it's like, okay, so there's people who are, who are introverts and don't wanna stand up. And it's like, okay, what could we do to deal with that to help get their information out? There's, there's processes where you know, everybody is, ends up communicating, particularly there's a thing called dynamic facilitation where you're talking to the facilitator and the facilitator, each person is talking to the facilitator and the facilitator is reflecting back what they're hearing and your sense of being fully heard in the public space where everybody's listening to, but you're, you're in this micro relationship to the, to the facilitator and they're paying you really good attention and giving you a sense. They get the emotional level of what you're doing. They've got the intellectual, you know, experiential content, et cetera. And that changes your participation, uh, particularly when you watch it happening with other people too. And if somebody interrupts you, you know, the facilitator says, just a minute, I'll get to you. And then finishes with you and then goes to the other person goes, what's your concern? So the interruption that what's normally seen as a, as a disturbance in the group, which is try to be silenced is seen as a concern, which is valuable information. Let's get it out and into the public space. An environment can be created in which whether you're bashful or aggressive is sort of absorbed into the process. Uh, and it's not a it's not a problem. You may be sitting back and not saying anything. Facil all many processes, facilitators will say, "Ah, I see, Jen, you haven't said anything for a while. I'm wondering if you could give us a sense of what's on your mind." And depending on the quality of the facilitator and the nature of the process, you'll feel, "Okay, well, I guess what I want is wanted, and there's not going to be any horrible consequences." And after that happens a couple of times, you relax and get into the flow of things. How should that be applied in open space? I don't know, but it's the sense of inquiry, knowing that having people be heard, getting their gifts into the public, public space is a desirable thing. So let's figure out how to do that. And there's technological ways to you know, have, have a, a comment space where people can put up their thoughts privately, have somebody who's rotating through the crowd saying, you haven't said very much. Could you, you know, I wanna see you say, well, this is what I would say if I had courage to stand up. Okay, well, say your thing and then I'll present it for people or something. So once you ask the questions, the question becomes a, an opportunity to learn and to improve the situation rather than a obstacle. Uh, and both the digital technologies and the, and the personal, you know, in-person communication technologies are really valuable and just need to connect up and start synergizing. Go ahead. <laughs> I'll just say from facilitating Kalia's event that she co-founded IIW over years now, and there always being a batch of new people. As the facilitator, I walk in the circle and I look at as many people in the eye as I can. And I can see people that are hesitant. There's other than the people who are comfortable, you can see the first person who comes forward who's brave because it's something they're really passionate about. And boy, they've been given permission, explicit permission from me, the facilitator, to call that session and they know it's a chance for them. After that first person comes forward, then I see other people go, oh, it's safe. The person who, there is a person listening to me as I say, this is what I'd like to talk about. Um, and also there's some strange thing about that's the rules of this game. You know, we're talking about social technologies, but it's almost like here are the rules that we're gonna play by today. And um, we really, really encourage you to take advantage of the fact that we're sitting in a setting that we don't often get to sit in. And there isn't somebody deciding for you what you should be discussing or what you should get out of this. 
Um, so, and the other stopgap uh, answer to your question is you get your friend who's not as shy as you are to call your session for you. <laughs> Kind of a cheater way, but you know that has happened as well. I don't know if Kalia. Yeah, I mean, I think too. Like you asked about the scale, or touched on that as an aspect of your question, Jen, and then so open space like different methods operate at different scales, and um, so open space can work you know, anywhere from like 10 people all the way up to a thousand people. And that's sort of where the upper limit is for that method. 3,000. Uh, 3, you've There's seen one. a 3,000, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Peggy, Peggy writes about it, so yes. Wow, okay. But um, so, you know, that's one of the, one of the things about this kind of catalog of these different technologies is they have different, different, um, they make different choices about how they take an in input, how they sense make with it, what the outputs are of the processes. And depending on those choices, they can, they can support different scales of people coming together and using them. And they also have different qualities of, um, some are, are more divergent, like they're supporting exploration of all the possibilities in a system. Open space is particularly good at that because it sort of says anybody who's in the circle can call um, any session they want after they were inspired to be there from the, the calling invitation. <clears throat> Other methods explicitly sort of start with a question that's, that's looking for more of an answer and they're more convergent or even the structure of them is, is supporting more convergence. So an example of a method that I use sometimes in the context of, of on conferences is a fishbowl. So you ask a question and you have people sitting in the center and the participants sitting around them and then you leave one of the chairs open in that middle circle that's dialoguing with each other and someone who's a participant can come sit in it and then one of the people who's in the center steps away to always leave an open seat but in that model the everybody's listening to the same conversation which is convergent energetically Whereas in open space, all the people would be at whichever session they feel inspired to be at, right? So these are um, these um, shapes of the technology support achieving different types of goals. There's another dynamic other than convergent and divergent, which overlaps them, but also has its own unique features, which is emergent, which is out of either a convergent or a divergent things separate from the process, something shows up that people go, oh yeah, that makes sense. And everybody wants to go in that direction where it wasn't sort of carved away, you know, like you're trying to get consensus on something or people are getting, negotiating, making something that works for them uh, or the divergent, which is just explore everything. Both of those processes and others that are specifically made like dynamic facilitation, specifically made for facilitating emergence. So those three things you see in a lot of different processes, those dynamics and often a <laughs> sort of divergent convergent pattern is often present. And a lot of what you're all talking about, it's, it, it's very much in person. You're near the people from what it sounds like. It's all in-person experiences, right? Prior to the pandemic. <laughs> oh, yeah, because yeah. <laughs> I know Tom, you you had some comments. Uh, Radical Exchange has produced a tool, well, a set of processes as well, more than just a an application, a web app uh, called Radical Exchange Voice, and that has several uh, steps to it. Several processes. First, delegation, bringing in more people 
making sure you have the right stakeholders part of the discussion um, or part of solving whatever the problem has been put out there as. And then it goes to a process of polis, using polis to, and that's what we've talked about that as deliberation. I know you have some contention with that. So I'm curious, like what expansive ideas you might have to, towards the tool or what you can touch on about it. But polis, for those that don't know it or haven't participated in RxC Voice yet, it's a, it's a tool that's embedded into RxC Voice where you can make statements in response to the question. So our question to the community was what, what should radical exchange focus on in the coming year? And you could agree, disagree, or pass on what other people make state, have stated and add your own. And then from that stage, it goes to um, like a ballot construction of those answers. Some things are duplicates, so they're thrown out. Some are completely irrelevant or they're not questions. Some need to bro be broken apart. And then that's put through a, a quadratic vote to everybody. And there's the possibility of um, ratifying uh, ballot ratification as well during that you have to agree to the ballot <clears throat> and somebody could if if enough people disagree with the ballot uh down vote it then it doesn't get ratified so and that can be done in multiple iterations of course but the the deliberation the the part of democracy like the democratic practice that tom you've you've talked about before do you what are your thoughts on rxc voice and using these stages and where do you maybe think it can expand well first of all it's it's a great process it's way better than you know 80 90 percent of the other process people have it has a uh, it has a convergent bias you're getting to a final place and you're gonna it's sort of designed to either get there or get nothing you know you're going to find a convergent thing that everybody's going to go along with or your whole process stops uh, and that's kind of a bug but it's much better than here's your two options vote for which one you like uh, and the idea that the, the uh, polis this i just want to make clear polis can be used in many different con contexts other than in your um, in your radical exchange waste process uh, but and one of the one of the things I just interesting coming to me in this conversation because I was about to say there's a limit to how much emergent dynamic you have the con the divergence of polis and the AI there's an AI in polis which is looking at what people are saying putting them into groups and then looking for agreements and disagreements between those groups and so the AI even though nobody's actually talking to each other the AI is able to extract consensus from the group, which is what well, fascinated me. You know, usually consensus, I go, people need to be talking together, uh, but there's no talking together. The AI just adds that additional layer and finds agreements between people who ordinarily disagree with each other. Uh, so that's quite powerful addition. Um, but for me, when, when I first ran across Paulus, it was in the context of V Taiwan. Uh, which I know a lot of the people you know, in radical exchange are familiar with. And it, it's a way of an aspect of governance that was basically created by civic hackers in Taiwan. Uh, and they use polis, but when they, after they use polis, they have a face-to-face -face conversation, facilitated conversation among stakeholders. And polis informs that conversation. Uh, there's a level of, I'm, I'm biased towards emergent processes. That's my favorite dynamic in processes. I love the group aha kind of thing. I go, that you found it. You know, the indigenous people say we talk until there's nothing left but the obvious truth. And that's, yeah, okay, that's what we want. Uh, rather than compromises and power plays and all that. <clears throat> uh, so they're putting it, to me, it was very instructive that they put it into this other face-to-face -face conversation. Um, and got my phone beeping and trying to ignore it. Uh, and so I think that's the best use of polis. And I rec recognize in our conversation we're having right now that one of the most powerful 
aspect of emergent process is iteration, <clears throat> where the results of something feed into another interaction. <clears throat> so lots of interactions where things are feeding into and things are feeding into. And one way to do that is having face-to-face -face conversations that are adequately facilitated. So that feedback kind of dynamic is supported. Another way is just do something over a long period of time. Uh, that in Paulus, they noticed with one Paulus exercise they did over a month about Uber, you know, the whole Uber conflict versus taxis and all that. And they did it in four, you know, weekly installments kind of, and they noticed that the dynamics of how people participated changed over that period of time. So people near the end were number one, there were people sort of gaming it towards consensus. So this thing that wasn't agreed on, well, I think it's good. Let me see if I can rephrase it and put in a new thing that maybe more people agree on. So there was a more consensus things, more solid policy recommendations, stuff like that were showing up. And similar, I've noticed in open space, if you do open a one day open space, there's a certain dynamic that happens. If you do a three day open space, there's a certain dynamic that happens. If you do a five day open space, it's totally different. And it's all from the iterations people getting to know each other, getting into, into you know, comfortable with the process, thinking about ideas more deeply and new angles on them and all that. Um, so I could imagine if you did your, your process over again in an iterative way, you might end up, and I don't know this, but I'm just sensing into the theory of it, you might end up with more emergent stuff that was higher quality, more sense of group, yes, that's what we want. And there's people who do ratings instead of agree, disagree, which is a whole nother interesting, interesting thing. And voting processes, which use ratings rather than rankings uh, or you know, winner take all kind of stuff. So I'm, I'm just spouting off a variety of different factors that can be looked at in doing these things rather than saying this method is better than that method. It's like, hey, how can we play with this to get a better ideal result out of it? Yeah, I think that sounds spot on in terms of the finding some way to, I guess, the iterations, but also the clarifications of what we might mean, because how much you can actually put in this very small mm -hmm. statement. And even yourself, you might put out a statement and not have fully absorbed like what that exactly means and put it out vaguely, or maybe it needs to be broad. And there's so many inputs that affect what you output, your mood, your, you might just be, you know, how long do you have to even think about this question? A high leverage point is concerns. Yeah. If somebody has put out something and somebody else has concerns about it, there's lots of information and energy mm -hmm. contained within that concern. Yeah. So that's part of the power of dynamic facilitation is tapping into concern rather than blocking weird energies and weird ideas is to tap into the, the gem the valuable part that is that is contained within that that particular thing and you can create systems where it's designed around people having concerns and then the group trying to solve the concern mm -hmm. and the group evolves more and more into a bigger more fuller you know a fuller whole or more holistic more comprehensive kind of solution or direction to go because they're handling all these things which surfaced you know, all the little obstacles that we'd run into in the future if we didn't think about them now. You know, we're thinking about them now because all the people's different perspectives are showing up through their concerns. Yeah. I have a question from Slido. I haven't read it yet. Hold on. Um, okay, this is from Andrea Reginato. I've been participating to the last IIW open space and what I felt is that the UX for open space I've experienced was not as much intuitive as I would have expected. Are there tools you would suggest for online open spaces? That's a good oh, question. Heidi. <laughs> Go ahead, me. Heidi. Um, Kalia and I, uh, through a relationship that she had for a long time and with somebody that I met years ago, moved our IIW onto a platform called Kiko Chat, which was designed partly with open space in mind. Uh, the main 
aspect of it being that people can move themselves from room to room. They're not um, pulled or assigned links within Zoom. And so number one, that's a great platform, Kiko Chat. That's what we'll be doing the online um, RxC event on. And as a facilitator, now working online, I've done 15 open space events online in the last two years, some with people who've never done it, and also with people like the IIW community who've been do open, doing open space over and over and over again. They were, that group was pleasantly surprised on, they were all like, yeah, we don't know what this is going to be like. And when they came to Kiko Chat, they were like, wow, open space really works here. And these are people who've maybe done 20 yeah. or 30 open spaces with IIW. I'll share one comment right now. One of the people was, you know, it was six, the first, all, we shifted online with six weeks notice. And one of the people said, everything's totally crazy, but at least IIW was just the same. And we're like, oh, you thought the online version was the same as our face-to-face -face energy. And that was really heartening to us to feel like that the core feeling and connection of our community was maintained despite the shift to this online platform. And then with a few, with group, a few groups I've done that have not done open space before, number one, I got the same comments that you get in person about, wow, it was so great to just go to the session I wanted to. I loved that I could call a session. I liked that I had permission to leave a session that I didn't want to be in. The rules, the structure of open space held. And again, this is so pleasant to have something different from what we've now gotten used to in Zoom and not getting to meet in person. Um, so I think it's two things. It's a, the right platform. And then I've shifted the way that I facilitate. You know, um, I'll just share. Instead of telling people to look around the room, which I do if we're sitting physically, I say, let's take a few minutes and scroll through the screens in your Zoom and look at the faces. Like, look at everybody. These are the people that you're here with today, some of these faces you're going to be in a small conversation with and you'll get to know them. So over time, facilitators, I think, have adapted how they try to make that connection online that at least I find easier, have found easier in person, and it can still work. Well, it can still work really well. There, there are a bunch of um, open space technologies that I don't know if you want to touch on, Heidi and Kalia, like the council process, World Cafe. Are there any of these that you would maybe help this person? I, we'll put them in the chat as well. Technologies. Tom is like the super encyclopedia of processes. There a, so I'm going to let a, him go to town. <laughs> is there a special, they're, you're equating, equating the most open space? What is this exact question? People are wondering, just wanting to know more about them. Well, that specific question was more about the UX for online open spaces and how to better um, make the experience better, I think more like in person. But then we also had, um, I understand that there are other, in addition to open space technologies, there are other technologies that could possibly, I wonder if they're transferable to online, such as yes. council process. Yeah, you can do council. There are, there are people online who created special, you actually have a visual with a circle and people's names around the circle and sometimes there are you know, images of them and all the rest. Uh, mm -hmm. So there, won't, there are ways to do that online. Uh, World Cafe goes really well with open space. You can do World Cafe is people, there's some question everybody's looking at. I was part of an open space that started with a World Cafe. And the question for the World Cafe was what issue, what question if we addressed it really well here would make all the difference in the world. So this is a five day open space with a morning, first morning is a, is a World Cafe. 
and the World Cafe, people sit at little tables of three, four, five people and talk about the issue for 20 minutes, 40 minutes, whatever. And then a bell rings and people get up and mix around and go into totally different groups. And when they get into those groups, they sort of say, what happened in their previous group? What was sort of going on in the previous group? And now what are we gonna do? And talk, 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 and then bing, they go mix up again. So there's a funny way in which you get both the, uh, um, the ch a lot of air time and hearing people in an intimate setting combined with knowledge of what's going on in the larger group because people bring that knowledge in and it's, con it's an iterative process, it's really intensely iterative. Things are folding back on themselves constantly. Uh, and then at the end, there's a harvest of things that were significant for people individually. So that process in that context with a open space coming up, stirred up people's energies and ideas. And then when they opened the space after lunch, the energies were there and people were giving their, here's what I want to talk about, here's what I want to do kind of stuff. And that fed it. And you can have at the end, because it's so fragmenting, open space is in a sense so fragmenting because people are in their separate sessions and nobody knows everything that's going on. You can do a world cafe at the end of an open space where people from very different sessions are talking together about what went on in their session that has to do with whatever the overall inquiry was and then harvest that. And again, it's not convergent, but you're, you're giving some convergent energy to very diverse things. That's an example of people putting them together. Uh, and what was it, open space world? Oh, and circle, yeah. Yeah, council circle is very basic. Most of the sessions in open space are done, you know, well, many, many of them done are in council circle where you take turns going around a lot more popcorn where, and every now and then you have one that's run by the, the guy who has to keep talking. <laughs> and, and since you're encouraged in open space to leave any session where, you, where you, uh, you're not learning or contributing or having fun, you're encouraged to, if the guy's taking over and you're not interested in what he's saying, get up and walk out. <laughs> and pretty soon he'll be alone and that's, that will be a lesson for him. <laughs> And then there's one that relates to the McLeans in Canada. There's a process. Uh, yes. Okay, so this is this, this is, is a big D democracy. This is a, a big state. this is a big D. But the question of scale, uh, there's a lot of different ways to approach scale. I have a if you look up on TomAtleyBlog.com uh, and put scale in the in it, you will run across a series I did on uh, how to put things get things to happen at scale. McLean's is a feature in that. This is 1991, Canada's coming apart. Quebec wants us to see the indigenous people are making the legitimate point that this is, we're not just an interest group, this is our land you're doing all your stuff on uh, without acknowledging it and you stole it from us and et cetera. So it's like the whole country is coming apart and lots of things that tried to be done which weren't successful. And McLean's is like the Time Magazine of Canada, you know, the glossy news weekly. Uh, has a lot of visibility and they work with Canadian TV, major TV station in Canada, public TV. And they, they hired their polling firm to find 12 people whose diversity collectively represented the diversity of Canada demographically. So political opinions and race and location and all that, um, gender. And so these three to 12 people were pulled together and they hired Roger Fisher, who was author of a very famous book called Getting PS, negotiation expert, worked all over the world. Uh, and they said, okay, and they didn't know what was gonna happen. They said, okay, here's, here's these 12 guys, here's Roger Fisher, you got two and a half days, see if you can come up with a vision for Canada. <laughs> and the whole thing was very dramatic. People, it, it, it almost fell apart. It was a weekend thing. And by, Friday night or Saturday night, it was uh, had almost come apart. And uh, Fisher's off going over the chart pads, trying to find something that maybe can be salvaged from all this. And these two women are talking together at dinner on, on Saturday night. And the Quebec woman is going, you guys just don't fucking get it. You know, you have, you're, this is nothing's gonna happen here. You're, and, and this Canadian woman was listening to it really well for, you know, 20 minutes, half an hour. And the uh, Quebec woman is so, impressed she says if this is possible anything's possible and the next morning she goes to the indigenous woman and says what's it like for you tell me you know and so it's the women that made the shift you know not really the facilitators they didn't the facilitators let it happen and encouraged it 
Uh, and then they spent Sunday working over the stuff Roger Fisher had pulled together. So it's like the the facilitator Fisher was working on the head part and the women were working on the heart part. And they came together the next day and they ended up with this thing. So the process itself is fascinating. But there's many things that are like that that have happened, that have happened since then. There's a, a forum called a mini public, which is a randomly selected group of diverse people, can be a dozen people, can be hundreds of people, uh, many variations that do that, many different processes used. Uh, so McQueen's did theirs, so that's not unique. Uh, but McQueen's being a magazine did 40 pages of coverage. I mean, when have you ever seen any magazine of that type do 40 pages of coverage on anything? You know, and what they, <laughs> what they did was sort of accidentally what they did was they had right at the beginning, here's, here's your 12 people, a half page bio with a picture of each one of the people that were selected. So, and then right after that is the, the blow by blow account. Here's Friday night, you know, 7.30, so-and-so says, it's like reading a script, you know, so-and-so says this and this and this. And of course that's edited, but you're getting the flow of the whole thing. And, you know, a couple hours in, you're seeing people, you know, leaning back with their arms crossed, you know, there's a, there's another guy, a sort of conservative guy from Canada. There's a picture of him with his head in his hand. You know, and you see people, all the body language is communicating all this stuff. There's pictures of the women talking together on the Saturday dinner. You know, and it goes through, goes through. And after you know, a dozen pages of this, you see, uh, I lost one of my, after a dozen pages of this, you see the end, everybody's hugging, hugging goodbye. You know, it's like the body language has evolved but you've watched the drama. It's not like, oh, everybody came together, all the things that people disagreed with were pushed to the side. And you know, finally there was a compromise kind of thing done. It's like, this is a very human dramatic, human interest story. From a, and I saw this and there's also an hour long public affairs thing that was done. All this was videoed by camera crews from uh, Canadian TV. And they had an hour long thing which presented all this. And I saw this magazine, somebody gave me this magazine out of the recycling pile. <laughs> you know, it's like, like, this is back in 1991, this, this thing before social media and all that. Uh, and I look at this magazine, how could this have not have changed Canada? You know, and I was working, I'd been working and befriended a guy who's a, um, a, um, <clears throat> a investigative reporter. And I said, I'll pay you to go and talk to these people. This is already 10 years later talk to these people who are involved, anybody you can find, you know, Roger Fisher and people at McLean's or whatever, and find out what happened, you know? And so he did, and he found out, they didn't think of it, they thought it was like a fancy focus group. This was not a democratic innovation. Uh, and, but what happened afterwards was conversations all over Canada. You know, it stimulated conversations and talk show stuff, a lot of talk show stuff. And the talk show people started to bring in politicians going, what do you think about this? You know, and the politicians are going, well, you know, they're, they're on the spot now because we the people <laughs> has been talking, you know, in a very visible way. And so I did my analysis on the web, my cointelligence.org website. I have a whole page detailing. I have the whole magazine up in PDF form. Uh, I have the, the CTV, um, video that you can watch, uh, and a whole pile of analysis, including all the interviews that were done. Uh, and the fact that it generated conversation all over Canada and modeled a nation talking to itself. Uh, it's sort of like the fishbowl that Kalia was talking about. But in this case, you have a bunch of people who by design or by random selection, whatever, they are we the people, a microcosm of we the people. And that, if the whole is actually watching this microcosm of the whole, and there's iteration, and that's where McQueen's fell down. They didn't do it again the next year. Can you imagine this kind of thing happening every year? Can you imagine what would happen in the era of um, social media? You know, the kind of informational and conversational spread and then you put things like Paul Liss in there to start digesting the diversity and feeding the Paul Liss back into another one of these, you know, microcosm 
the macrocosm watching the microcosm. You know, it's just like the potential is just gigantic. And you look up McQueen's The People's Verdict, which is the name of the issue, and 90% of what comes up is stuff that I've written about it. And it's like, hello, knock, knock, wake up. This is, a, <laughs> this is breakthrough. This is how you get what's little in the, going on in the room. We know so much about how to handle people in a room and how to generate collective wisdom and connection and all that. But this question of scale has not been adequately addressed. If the people in the room also are well networked, that helps too, because whatever happens in the room, they take out through their networks. There's a variety of approaches to scaling also. And how, how much do you think, because it seems like it was really important that there was just one person. So it wasn't like a representative group of the population. It wasn't like there were five people that were this type of person with this kind of beliefs and from this location and one person, it's one of each. So how much do you think that? No, that, no? that's not quite what it is because oh, there were okay. different demographics. Like there would be, you, you're, you want to have six men and six women. You want to yeah. have a, you do, you do have one indigenous person because that's not a large population within the population, but you will but, have women who are conservatives, women who are liberals, women who are from this, this place in this, but there are also, there's a, um, a guy in at Stanford who's been doing these microcosm things, his version of it called um, um, <clears throat> deliberative polling. He polls people at the beginning. He has like 500, America in one room. He had a big thing with five, more than 500 people, all randomly selected like with survey technology. And those 500 people were surveyed at the beginning about their opinions about the issues. And then they're We'll talk to experts about those issues and then talk to each other about those issues and then surveyed again at the end. That's his, his approach, but he's one of the few who uses hundreds of people. So the numbers of people, there's all sorts of <coughs> theories about that. And if you wanna do 500 people, you can, but it's gonna cost you a mint. If you're but a community, the, how do you do that? But with the McLeans, <laughs> it was all, there were six people. There were 12. 12 and they there were, were 12 people and they were scientifically selected to be a, yes. as representative of the whole population as you could. So that means that there were 12 populations in Canada that each one no, represented. No, no okay. they were like, they were I, like, I think when the, when they did the political perspective thing, they came up with six sort of values frames that different groups had same and how many people were in each of those. And so they're trying to reflect that in their 12 people. They're trying to reflect the okay. number of people of color in yeah. their people. It's really hard. Random selection doesn't do that. No. When you, but if you're doing it scientifically, you can get much quicker because each person is mm -hmm. representing many different demographics, well, demographic cuts. Yeah. But that if makes... you do iteration, if you do mm -hmm. random selection with 12 people every three months, you're going to cover the ground pretty mm -hmm. well. So the iteration again can replace that, that problem. Mm -hmm. Thanks. That's yeah, I, I always love Don't hearing about that story. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think it's one of the most fascinating stories in the world of deliberative democracy. Yeah, and it's really a shame they didn't do it again. Heidi, do you want to touch on Lewis deep democracy? No, I don't have to yeah, yes. yes. Um, you know, when Kalia, I, when I called Kalia and said, okay, tell me what, <laughs> I'm an open space facilitator. How do I participate in this? I remembered this process that I learned back in 2006, 2007. Um, at the time, it was just called Deep Democracy. Now it's called Lewis Deep Democracy. Um, and I, there's a link that, that you can go to that you can put in the chat. Um, um, so I'm happy to see that it has continued. What, found, what grabbed my attention when I first came across it from Myrna Lewis, the woman who had developed it with her former husband, um, is that they were charged with helping one of the largest power companies in South Africa deal with the fact after apartheid ended that now supposedly everybody was equal, 
inside this public utility. And they knew that they couldn't handle it with, you know, 500 psychologists dealing with the issue, all of the issues from many years of apartheid, but now you get to be democratic, right? And now you get to. And thumbnail sketch is, I can remember her saying this, the problem with the majority vote way of doing things is that the 49 and a half percent that didn't get to win, they're not all of a sudden going along with what the majority is getting. And how is there a process to help them help them go along? And she, the image, the graphics that were used were sheep. And how do you get everybody to get on the bus together? And they had developed a process to look at the wisdom inside the no, that, that, and that often there's a, gra a grain of truth. And if the majority listens to that little grain of truth, then more people will go along. They have one thing that they'd like to have different, et cetera. Um, what was most powerful about the process is that it included conflict resolution which you're bound to um, uh, come up against. In the TED talk that I listened to on the new website um, that Myrna gives, it's really about that conflict resolution process, which was fascinating to learn. When I learned it, there was a literal physical component and I'm a big proponent of that things live within us physically. And so there's a, a portion, there's a step where if it's two groups, you literally stand up in a room and there's a line in the middle and you do this thing called throwing all of your spears, um, which is all of the objections that you have. The other side doesn't get to say anything. And then the other side does theirs. And you can go back and forth several times until everyone has said everything that they want to say. They're not saving, as she would say, what we usually do is we save some arrows in our quiver for the next bite, and then we can whip them out. So this is about them all coming out. And then everybody in the room looking for the grain of truth in one of those arrows that was flung at you. And when I learned it and experienced it several times, I had an experience. Tom talks about the whole group getting something, like it comes. I can remember sitting there and feeling the energy in the room shift because everybody in the room got something and, um, and things shifted. So I had, did not get to facilitate the process because there weren't any other facilitators in the States after, when I learned it. Um, but I did use it in several situations in some decision making, like you're trying to make a decision and I would have the group go back and forth across the line, like this is what I wanna do now, and now this is what I wanna do and it worked there. Um, I think it's a brilliant process. It looks like it's being used globally now. Um, I, if people are interested in a social technology that is specifically addresses um, conflict resolution as part of what needs to be addressed that was born out from in a very conflict um, rife place, South Africa, I highly, highly recommend checking it out. And I'm so happy to see um, uh, the website with so much information now. And I was very grateful just right now in my life to be reminded about the wisdom in the know personally. Like that, that's a really interesting thing to keep personally, just to, to keep remembering. So um, I would include that in Kalia's, when I would really didn't understand what she was saying, I was like, oh yeah, that's a social democratic technology, you know, process. So that that's all I have to share about it, but I just have to say it's fascinating. It's very well thought out looks like there's a big network now that can be accessed for that work. And it's something you can learn and do. Great. Yeah, I didn't know that, that example, but it's, 
it's so the the thread that just goes through all of this is being heard and when we're talking about like really big one of the biggest problems that we have and audrey tang who's the digital minister of taiwan and one of uh, a part of radical exchange as a board member she um she talks about how we need to change how we governments can listen because right now it's a one to many it's the public is listening to the government the public is listening to the leader and instead we need this broad listening we need to change that around we, they need to be able to listen to us at scale and that's the big democracy that's like the really big challenge is that's climate change how do we solve these things together and how do we even like how are we heard about where we want to go i don't know if kalia this relates to the citizen panels yeah it, it's a it's um i wanted to share around the topic of big b democracy a process that i was a small piece of um, i was actually born and raised in british columbia but i've lived in california for a long time but um british columbia um was working on developing uh, an identity system. They called it their citizen services card. Um, they had enough money to support citizens sort of having one official identity document from the province, like an equivalent to a driver's license, but they also needed to use it for their healthcare system. And so this was like connecting two types of identity that hadn't been connected together, but the healthcare cards didn't have photos on them, but they didn't have money to take everybody's photo and send them a card twice. So they needed to figure out how to build a system that was privacy preserving, but also met the needs of the, the stakeholders, all the citizens of the province. And they decided to do three different listening processes that they wove together. One was they wanted a, they did a citizens panel, cousin of the citizens jury, but they, um, they selected 36 randomly selected um, folks from around the province. And the way they found them was they used the voter roll and they sent postcards to every sixth voter on the list. And then they said, please reply on this postcard if you or anyone in your house is willing to fly to Vancouver for two weekends, for two weekends of deliberation about this new citizen services card and the future policy for its use. And so they had, that's how they got their sort of initial pool of potential, 36 potential people. And then they, they picked from there and made sure they had people from all over the province. And so they, one part was bringing those citizens together for two weekends where they educated them about the system and they got to listen to experts and interview them. And there was a whole report about that process um, that they went through. They also had a, um, a, a conference of experts sharing and using open space technology. And I was the facilitator of that open space. And if those, some of the, if the citizens wanted to come to that open space, they were welcome to. So that was really interesting having them as part of that expert forum. And they also did an online survey where anyone in the whole province could comment. And so that was like the digital way of listening to the whole province. And they pulled that all together and presented it to the government as like, here's what the citizens think about this. And it helped inform their future policy around the use of the card. And did the government take it? Um, yeah, but it really helped them understand sort of where the edges were of what mm -hmm. citizens felt comfortable for the card to be used for and what things they didn't feel comfortable. Um, yeah, and it helped, you know, these processes that invite a sort of public voice in also help the, the decisions have legitimacy. And people could see themselves in the citizens who were part of the panel because they 
like t- like they did for McLean's, they put in little bios of all those people so that um, it wasn't like, it wasn't like 36 random people that we don't know anything about. It was like, oh, well, that person lives in my area or they share my profession or, you know, like different things that they could connect to and say, sort of like trust those folks to do good thinking for them and sort of accept the the end result as opposed to feeling like the government just came and imposed this identity mm-hmm. system on them. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to note one point I didn't note in my McLean's that is applicable here is not only does it give legitimacy, but it also gives the vicarious experience because when you give the bios of the people, you are, in McLean's case, you are identifying who you agree with and who you disagree with and then watching them go through the drama. You're getting a vicarious experience of what's going in the room. You're a fly on the wall actually seeing it unfold. So the person who you thought was just gonna defend everything you believed in is now shifting in the conversation and you're watching them shift and you have to deal with how you would have shifted if you were in that conversation. So they, it's not just legitimate, but actually going, whoa, this is a different kind of conversation than I'm used to. You know, he wasn't fighting, he was actually listening. What, Tom, I know that you, you often work with a lot of, I mean, you even live with a number of people in a, in a collective way, what kind of small, small D democracy issues do you, do you find the most challenging? Oh, well, you are seeing me in my room in the co-op house I live in (laughs) uh, with uh, eight other people, sometimes nine other people, but right now it's eight other people. And we use a uh, sloppy casual version of concern-based consensus process uh, and straw polling. So we're talking, we have a house meeting every week, uh, a two hour house meeting. And, you know, as we're talking about an issue, the facilitator, and we take turns doing facilitation, the facilitator can say, it sounds like we're talking about this, how do people feel sort of get an, you know, hand hand signal kind of thing about how you feel about it uh and sometimes because we're sloppy uh we let that be a vote if everybody's going like this like why go further with this uh but the facilitator theoretically and sometimes actually goes does anybody have any concerns and not does does anybody have any concerns it's like i want to know if you've got concerns i want to know so we can address them uh, and it's, so it's using concerns in the way that I was talking about earlier. Uh, one of the biggest challenges is the, uh, the rollover. When we have the same people, I've been here for 21 years in this house. Uh, and when we have the same people year after year, the culture grows. Whatever the culture is gonna be grows and, there's, and the relationships grow and there's a sense of what, you know, what it is we're doing and why. Uh, and then if we, there was sometimes we had like four or five people leave in a year and new people come in. It's like, okay, push the reset button, you know, and the house actually was born out of a dynamic facilitation training. Uh, and now I'm the only person who's ever done any dynamic facilitation in the, in the house or actually one of two is another guy here who's, who has some experience in that. So it's like the, the, um, the dilution of the decision-making culture and the kinds of understandings. Like I have a a theory I call co-sensing, which is different from consensus. It's like if consensus, you're agreeing to something which you're then gonna be ruled by and you come to an agreement. And co-sensing is if people aren't following what we supposedly agreed on, there's obviously no longer a living agreement. So we should talk about it more, but that takes a lot of time. You know, and a lot of people have their, you know, everybody's doing their own thing. We all know that it's all happens in our own lives. 
and to take the time to do the work that will get the result. Uh, the decision to recognize part of it is a, a need to have a shared worldview that there are such powerful benefits available from doing this kind of thing smart, wise, you know, from a point of understanding what you're doing and why you're doing it, uh, that it's worth taking the time. They often say, when people argue about consensus, you know, it's like consensus takes lots of time. So you get a choice whether to do that up front and come up with a really good thing that everybody's on board with and that covers the ground of what you need to consider. Or you can spend that time later on with all the messes you run into where people disagree and you haven't covered the ground. You have to wrestle with those problems. But people are basically, we're in the middle of a consensus process. I really need to get onto my work. It's getting to be, you know, 8.30 and I don't want to go too long. And so it's like, that's the big challenge. And I think that's true in, it's true to a certain extent in the mini public kind of citizen council thing where you're trying to get people at random and certain people have a harder time or are not interested. How random do you want to be? And you get a whole pile of older people who are retired and have the time to show up. Uh, and you get this single mother with four kids and two jobs and she can't come. So, okay, we're going to pay these people. We're going to provide childcare. We're going to give, you know, access, special access, support for people who speak a different language. It's like, and then you don't have enough money to do all that. So there's like the logistics of doing this well. So everything is an, appro an approximation and judgment calls and to have a, um, a subculture of people who are sophisticated enough at this to make good judgment calls. That's the profession that we don't have, you know, in our societies. And if we were actually going to solve the kinds of, you know, climate change and stuff, we would have people thinking strategically about this and weeding all the different gifts that the different processes offer us, including the online kinds of things. The, uh, this, what do they call it? The, a, when you're doing it all at different times, everybody, anybody can participate asynchronous, is that the word? Uh, so the online has a more potential for asynchronous dimensions, but having synchronous and asynchronous, both online and in person, I mean, it's just like, that's my, my focus has been trying to get down to the underlying dynamics so that wise decisions could be made about all this uh, rather than writing a particular process. But the field of dialogue and deliberation that has, that has the know-how does not necessarily have the interest in uh, weaving things together and, uh, and doing them for democracy. <laughs> rather than to support organizations, corporations, whatever, and getting their stuff yeah. done. I think um, building on what you're saying, Tom, I think um, one of the events you told me about and then I became an avid attender of as well is the National Coalition for Dialogue and Deliberation yes. and that organization um, and uh, the audience can go see their website at ncdd.org mm -hmm. has, uh, as far as I know, the world's like largest collection of these types of processes and methods and has written some really great work about like understanding their differences and where you might use a world cafe versus an open space versus a, a council process and, and many, many more. Um, there's literally, you know, I'm hundreds, if not over thousands different that, that these, um, that there is so much opportunity to apply them to the problems that we have in our world, but that the main places they are used are, as you said, within organizational contexts and sometimes in a kind of community context of like, mm -hmm. you know, what should the youth center in our neighborhood be like, which is like, you know, it's public, but it's like tiny scale. And that there is, you know, I would say to any funders listening being like, I wanna help fix democracy and address climate change putting funding into the questions Tom just raised and researching 
the dynamics of different methods and how they can be um, both used in their fullest as as the methods that they are, but also woven together in ways that are more, um, even more generative and have greater potential to address our problems. Um, you know, like that's what I would love to see because as I opened, like there are social technologies deserving of research money and inquiry and um, sort of social scientific rigor in the same way that we apply this rigor to computer science or mechanical engineering and and all those those um types of disciplines there's not so much money involved in uh, that is doesn't generate financial return it just helps save us from extinction <laughs> we, we did that that kind of that kind of research <clears throat> and i think facilitate i think uh, Kalia would be happy to, Kalia and Heidi would be happy to facilitate a conference of people involved in philanthropy on to how to reset philanthropy for the survival of the human race and the transformation of civilization. Uh, <laughs> <That sounds. laughs> we actually did an open space that was along those lines, Peggy Holman and, and I in 2006. Uh, but that's a long time ago, 15 years time to do some more like that. Because there's not shortage of money, there's plenty of money floating around. Just where is it going and why? I put into the chat, ncd.org and participedia.org also has lots of uh, hundreds of processes and uh, case, case studies and stuff in it, if people are interested in that. Thank you. Heidi, do you have anything you want to add to the, no. Yeah, I think the resetting philanthropy is really, really important. We have 10 minutes left. So I want to make sure that you all, that we've covered everything. Mm. I don't have any questions from Slido. Um, all right. I just put these when I put my posts into the chat. I realized the only people it's going to are the people on this. No, actually, that screen. is going to the whole audience. Right. Oh, okay. Oh wait, there's one question. The magic elves are doing it, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yay! Magic elves are always vital. <laughs> magic so technology. one question. Oh, Heidi, go ahead, and then I'll ask. This. Well, I just want to say to the. RxC community that Kalia would not have recommended using open space if she didn't think it was the perfect fit for what you all are interested in, the diversity of the things that you're talking about, the urgency with which there are things to be dealt with, and the difference of opinion around how to do things, which are all conditions that make for a really great open space. Um, I, I just want to say, give it a whirl, come and participate, um, find out what it's like, because I think it's a process not only that RxC can use, but what you might use even then in your own chapters and your own groups, etc. And I know Jennifer will talk a little bit more about the, the sort of flow of the whole month of, of things that are going to be happening. But um, um, I hope that you're more curious, interested, and excited than scared uh, that, you that you don't get to just sit and listen to people for, for however many days, that you actually get to come and participate, which is, uh, in my mind, some of what you all are doing anyway, is participating in life and in your communities and in your cultural places, et cetera, and open space is perfect structure for that, those types of conversations to happen. So that's, I'll just, I'll, that'll be my final piece. No, it won't. Heidi, share, share the principles and the law. We haven't shared that. People who have never- So um, whoever comes are the right people. Whatever happens is the only thing that could have, whenever it starts is the right time. And when it's <coughs> over, it's over. 
that would be explained a little bit more at the opening. And then there are two, the, the main law, which was, has been referred to here, which is the law of two feet or the law of motion and responsibility, which says that if you land in a session and you're not learning, contributing or having fun, as Tom said, or the discussion isn't what you thought it was gonna be about, you're actually encouraged and somewhat directed to take responsibility for yourself respectfully, leave the Zoom or get up and go somewhere that you will be learning and contributing. That movement creates the two insects of open space, which are the bumblebee and the butterfly. Bumblebees are known for pollinating and especially cross-pollinating. So if you find yourself in a session time slot where there are three different sessions you'd like to go to, um, you're more than welcome to visit all three of them. That's part of the rules of this of the game. And butterflies are known as still points in nature um, and in open space, uh, at a physical open space, that's often the person that isn't in any of the sessions and is sitting out in the foyer or somewhere else in the space. And you walk by them while you're being a bumblebee and you end up having the best conversation of the whole conference. Um, but it's also permission to take a break and be still. You don't have to be going to something the whole time. That's a very short um, synopsis of the principles in the law of open space, which are kind of like the rules by which we all um, will, will uh, interact together for the day. Holly, I don't know if you have anything to add. Thanks, Heidi. I could just add from Radical Exchanges perspective, from the foundation's perspective, the the choosing of doing this. Kalia had been saying to us over the years, try open space, try open space. And <clears throat> we wanted to, we didn't know it seemed, uh, but we also wanted to make sure that ideas were shared uh, from specialists, but it becomes increasingly important to experiment with ways that everybody can feel heard, everybody can find each other in in these kinds of settings that we don't have. Um, we're, we're often busy. We have enough information coming into us, into our heads and curated content that I think these kinds of interactions, these kinds of working together is crucial and critical at this point. Um, so I really hope that everybody, again, is not afraid and will join us for these three events over December. And I think we'll probably start doing these more frequently as well. Um, they, again, I'll say they're in December, December 4th in Taiwan, in Taipei, venue to be determined, online on December 10th. GMT time, and then Denver, Colorado on December 17th. The information will, is, on, is on the website, radicalexchange.org back uh, forward slash 2021 hyphen conference. Uh, so you can find the information there. And we have a community call next week on Wednesday. I believe it's at noon. Sign up for our newsletter if you aren't already and you'll get the, the alerts for that. Um, Tom, it looked like you wanted to say something. I'm just saying that you can have, you're going to do the open space and you can channel it towards action. If you do, uh, uh, if you do your polis as part of one or all of the open spaces, polis points out points that everybody we're, agrees we're with. not putting polis and open space together yet Tom. we're starting <laughs> well, out I'm with just, just open space <laughs> you're okay. just getting ahead of uh, you're getting ahead of us that's maybe like <laughs> surprise surprise <laughs> <laughs> well i'm there's so. if there's there's other methods also than polis i'm just saying if you if and you can do it without i was thinking of the convergence dimension polis <laughs> provides a form of convergence <laughs> And then having people connect up around one of the things that everybody's kind of agrees should yeah. happen. 
uh, and then encouraging them to connect up and carry on in some form of ongoing group. Yeah. There have been world cafes <laughs> who do big cafe <laughs> things and then <laughs> Kalia's laugh is going, shut up, Tom, you're not on the matter. I like the idea. <laughs> we love all the ideas, but we got to do one thing. Like we got to like nail the somersault we're in the process of executing okay. and then we can do like double black flips later <laughs> <laughs> all right um, anyway as you can tell there's more to it than that always <laughs> yeah yeah great and i'm really grateful that tom you um you were you joined this conversation and are contributing your wisdom and knowledge to the RxC community. It feels really great. Yes, we're very lucky. I hope you can come to at least the online one in person in Denver would be wonderful. I think all of your expertise is gonna be invaluable and can only be experienced to a certain extent. Thank you so much. Please, um, everybody, follow on radicalexchange.org. Look at Tom's work, which you want to direct them to cointelligence? Um, okay, cointelligence.org, tomatleyblog.com, and wd-pl.com that I, I put the um, all of those are in the uh, Your bio. Well, no intelligence isn't, but the other ones are in the uh, the chat. Mm -hmm. I have no intelligence is with the McLean's link. <clears throat> anyway, I have a number of websites and they all have lots of stuff going on on them. Yeah. And then the I internet identity workshop. Yeah. But yeah. So that's one place. And I also have a website on conference.net that has information about my facilitation and work. And I think Heidi also has a website too. Yes. Heidi, what is, I don't have it in front of me. It's, it's um, HeidiNobantu.com. Yes. All of these are in the notes of the of the live stream, they should be also available on the website if you go to the content when it's gonna be posted later on. Um, and Twitter, of course, it's, it should be there. Thank you so much, all of you. It's been a lovely hour and a half. And thank you for everybody that's you, joined Jeff. us today. Thank you. Have a great Bye -bye. day. Bye. Bye.